the open house, they'll be highlighting their Walter Anderson prints, Wolf Studio birds, Harold Miller sculptures, and Shearwater pottery. And of course, museum members receive a 20% discount on purchases tomorrow. Next Tuesday, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. here at the museums, members of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians will demonstrate traditional beadwork and basket weaving, dance, and stickball in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. Then at 6 p.m. next Thursday, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will have the last Under the Light program of 2019, this one focusing on the museum's final gallery, Where Do We Go From Here? And mark your calendars for this year's Christmas by Candlelight Tour, which will be held Friday, December 6th, from 4.30 to 8 p.m., a come-and-go open house at the Governor's Mansion, Old Capitol Museum, State Capitol, Manship House Museum, Welty House, Winter Building, and of course these museums. There'll be free transportation running between them all, or you can drive yourself, come and go. It's a great holiday event. It's a great way to kick off the season. And then please join us next Wednesday when we close our 2019 season of History is Lunch with a look at the history of the Southeastern Conference and Jackson, which became its first corporate home in 1940 under Commissioner and former Mississippi Governor Mike Connor. Journalist Rick Cleveland will moderate a panel that will include SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey, former Mississippi State University Athletic Director Larry Templeton, current MSU Athletic Director John Cohen, and others. All are also invited to attend the unveiling of a new state historical marker at the Standard Life Building at 1030 that same morning. Today, though, we are delighted to have Todd Sanders to present William Nichols, Mississippi's Capital Architect. I've known Todd since our freshman year at Mississippi State University in 1986, and I was relying on that long friendship when I asked him to step in when the governor's schedule prevented him from appearing to discuss the new book uh, by University Press on the governor's mansion. We'll have that program in the spring with the governor and first lady, but today we'll look at the designer of the governor's mansion, architect William Nichols, and Todd is the co-author with Paul Hardencap of the book, The Architecture of William Nichols, Building the Antebellum South in North Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi. Todd Sanders is a native of Corinth. He earned a BA in history and an MS in architectural history from Mississippi State University, a longtime employee of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History in the Historic Preservation Division. Sanders is now liaison between MDAH and the Environmental Division of the Mississippi Department of Transportation. He is the author of Jackson's North State Street and the aforementioned biography of William Nichols. Help me welcome Todd Sanders. Good afternoon. So good to see you all. I appreciate you all showing up today, uh, even though I am not the governor, as Chris said, so, you know, be that as it may. Today we're going to talk briefly about William Nichols, the architect of the Governor's Mansion and the Old Capitol and a few other places here in Jackson that uh, you'll be familiar with probably, and one other place that isn't in Jackson, but I think it's very interesting to look at William Nichols' background, where he came from and what he did, and I think you'll appreciate that he was indeed a remarkable man, a remarkable architect, working in a pretty remarkable time period in our history. It seems rather strange, I suppose, to start off with a tombstone, but unfortunately, we have no idea what Mr. Nichols looked like. To our knowledge, uh, no photograph, no painting, no drawing, sketch, even a silhouette, to my knowledge, of Mr. Nichols has survived. So we really don't know what he looked like, but we know he is here, as he was buried in Lexington, Mississippi, in 1853, when he died on December 12th. And he was 73 years. Haply thy spirit in some higher sphere soars with emotions which it measured here, while thy worn frame enjoys its long repose, free from the cares of life and all its woes. Isn't that wonderful, very romantic uh, Victorian sentiment about Mr. Nichols? But it's interesting to start out with, he was a native of Bath, England, where he started, and where he was born, obviously in 1780, into a family of cabinet makers, uh, carpenters, builders, um, all that sort of thing, and he learned his trade as a designer and a cabinet maker there, and came to North Carolina in 1800, arrived there, and as so many people did, uh, came, coming from, the, um, from Europe to the New World, they were able to basically you know, be what they wanted to be. And in the case of Mr. Nichols, who had some talent, some training, some skill, which was certainly in short supply in the young United States when it came to architecture, he was able to fairly quickly 
become a well-known architect and actually within a few years was known as an architect and became the state architect first of North Carolina and we'll see what he did there. Uh, like Benjamin Latrobe, who was from England and arrived about the same time as Mr. Nichols, Mr. Latrobe ended up being the architect responsible for the rebuilding of the U.S. Capitol building after it was burned during the War of 1812, as well as the rebuilding of the White House. Uh, Mr. Nichols, on a much smaller, more provincial scale, uh, did very similar things to Mr. Latrobe, and Mr. Nichols was able to practice his entire career as a paid architect, which again at the time was pretty unusual. The profession of architect, as we know it and understand it today, was really a late 19th century development. Uh, in the early 19th century and before, architects apprenticed to builders, uh, cabinet makers, what have you, and learned uh, the design trade and the building trade through that and then could basically call themselves architect. And many times if you look through census records and other things, people will start out one year as a carpenter and the next census record they're an architect and maybe they're a builder or a carpenter by the next census. So it was a little more loose than we'd be used to today. But he started his career in North Carolina and very interesting, um, worked his way up, made a lot of good connections, which Mr. Nichols was very good at politicking, as they say, meeting prominent individuals, getting jobs from them, and working his way up. And that's essentially what happened in North Carolina. In the upper left-hand photograph here is a drawing of about 1811 of the 1794 North Carolina State House in Raleigh that was basically kind of a glorified courthouse. It wasn't really what we would expect a state capitol to look like. And honestly, at this early date, Nobody really knew what a state capitol building was supposed to look like. That was still kind of up in the air. Uh, Mr. Nichols obviously was familiar with what Mr. Latrobe had done in Washington with the capitol building there and found an opportunity to sell his services to the state of North Carolina and in so doing uh, by remodeling and enlarging this small building here into this very grand neoclassical uh, capitol building. This is what prompted the remodeling and enlarging of the older building. There were already some complaints that it was small and not very dignified and something more appropriate was needed for the state of North Carolina. Well, in 1815, the legislature had paid Antonio Canova, a famous Italian sculptor, to produce a sculpture of our first president, George Washington, that was then to sit in the Capitol building in North Carolina in Raleigh. And of course, there was no suitable place in the smaller, earlier building so Mr. Nichols said, hey, <laughs> let's expand it. Let's build a rotunda. Let's build new wings. Let's make it a much grander building. And he did. And unfortunately, Mr. Nichols uh, spent more than he told them he would spend and had all those problems that followed him throughout his entire career. And as he came west, the same problems followed him. He was a brilliant designer, had wonderful vision, but uh, unfortunately, he let his budgets get away from him and it caused issues. Also in North Carolina, he was one of the first architects um, to be involved with the design and expansion of a college campus. And this is his design for Gerard Ch Hall Chapel there at the University of North Carolina. Uh, he had been hired to design some new buildings and really kind of redesign and reorient the college campus. Uh, the plan was that this building would face south towards some undeveloped land and the college campus would grow in that direction. For a variety of reasons, it didn't happen at the time. So this impressive ionic portico um, ended up facing off into the woods for a long time until it eventually, by the end of the 19th century, had been removed because it was a hazard. But this was Mr. Nichols' complete from the ground up design for a chapel or assembly building at the University of North Carolina in conjunction with some other planning he was doing to redesign the campus there. And twice more in his career, he would design, in two other cases though, in Alabama and Mississippi, from the ground up, a college campus, college university. So again, we see a man who, in the early 19th century, becoming one of the few in this country to design state capitol buildings as well as college campuses. Uh, there just weren't that many architects who had done such. Interesting, before I move on, um, the book that uh, Paul Cap wrote and I helped him write, this building was where he was, as he says, first reacquainted with William Nichols. Paul grew up in Jackson. He was familiar with the old capitol and the governor's mansion, but I guess he kind of forgot about it, like so many people forgot about William Nichols over the years. But when he was in North Carolina and got the position to restore this building, he was reacquainted with William Nichols. So this job led to him wanting to write the biography on William Nichols, which led to my involvement, which is what you have today.
So that building is important and special to Paul for that respect and to me as well. Well, um, by the late 1820s, Mr. Nichols, as so many people had done in the older states along the East Coast, were moving west as the states of Alabama and Mississippi were open to settlement, all this uh, virgin land, all this wonderful uh, land for agriculture opened up. People moved west. Apparently, some folks in North Carolina referred to it as Alabama fever. <laughs> people just pick it up and going west. Well, so did Mr. Nichols. And he arrived in uh, Tuscaloosa, which was the state capital of Alabama at the time in 1827, and pretty soon became state architect of Alabama, designed there first state capital there in Tuscaloosa. Now, it's interesting to think, this was 1827, Mr. Nichols was 47, which for the 19th century is not a young person, but he still had another 20 plus years to go, <laughs> so he was a pretty stout individual. But this was his design for the state capital there in Tuscaloosa, and um, we'll see that in a minute. You can see the ground floor was rusticated stone with arcaded window openings, Instead of actually having an open portico here, we have uh, an enclosed portico, sort of a pseudo portico there, a shallow dome with a cupola, and some more Roman architectural elements than Greek revival that we'll see later. So we see him taking, and we'll see this slide in a minute, his ideas that he developed at the North Carolina State Capitol, and then here from the ground up, builds a brand new capital in Tuscaloosa and a brand new city on the Alabama River in a brand new state. This is an interior of the House of Representatives in the Tuscaloosa capital that he designed. And you can see wonderful uh, ionic columns around the backside. It's very interesting how much he enjoyed the ionic order. He uses it throughout his career, which is very interesting. It's not the most elaborate or grandest of the Greek or Roman orders, but it isn't the simplest either. It's kind of like in the middle, and it does make for a very dignified, very elegant composition. Um, for those of you that may obviously know that Tuscaloosa is not the state capital of Alabama. They moved to Montgomery in the 1840s, I believe it was, and this building was abandoned, became a school, and eventually in 1923 succumbed to an electrical fire and burned to the ground, so it's gone. The earlier capital in North Carolina in the 1830s burned to the ground, and Mr. Nichols was originally supposed to go back and rebuild it, but things didn't happen that way. He was here busy with other things, and it didn't happen that he was involved with it. So of his three state capitol buildings, the only one to survive is his latest, and if you'll excuse me, his greatest, which stands right over there. So we're very fortunate to have that. And speaking of our capitol building, there it is. And the oldest known photograph of the building, you'll notice um, one of the big differences from the way it is today, there are trabeated or square-topped openings leading into the basement level uh, entrance of the building, which is very typical of Greek Revival architecture rather than the arcade that we saw on the earlier capital in Alabama and that we see now on our capital building. The arcade at the first floor of our capital today, right, whoops, let me get to that screen, there dates from an 1870 remodeling of the building. So that was not Mr. Nichols' original design. Originally, they were straight topped openings, very typical of the Greek Revival style. Well, Mr. Nichols like I said, left uh, Alabama in the early 1830s, but he didn't get here until 1836. In the interim, he went to Louisiana. He had applied for the position as chief architect here for the state of Mississippi to design the buildings that the state needed to build here in Jackson. He was passed over for the job. Um, I'm, this isn't anything new. Politics got in the way. The governor at the time had someone he wanted for the job. Uh, who got the job, rather than a man who'd already done two state capitals and honestly probably had more experience in those, uh, the designing of state capitals than anybody working in the country at the time. But politics is politics. So Mr. Nichols instead went to Louisiana and took a job as assistant state engineer and worked in New Orleans and uh, remodeled an old hospital there for the legislature of Louisiana to meet while they were meeting in New Orleans and designed the state penitentiary for the state of Louisiana. Uh, he was given no opportunity to be creative in his design for that penitentiary because one of the members of the legislature said, here's a picture. This is a New England penitentiary up in Connecticut. I want it to look just like this. And he did. He did just like that. That building, unfortunately, was taken down in the early 20th century. But while he was in New Orleans, he was exposed to the wonderful new or modern, or as we would call it, Greek Revival architecture. 
You can see from the work he did earlier, he was well-versed in classical traditions, primarily English traditions, more Roman in their inspiration, and not really so much Greek. But by the 1830s, New Orleans was booming. It was the second biggest port in the country, very busy. Some of the greatest architects in the country were building there in the modern Greek revival style, which, as the name implies, was a revival of the architecture of ancient Greece. Going back beyond the architecture of Rome to the beginning of all great Western classical architecture. And while he was there, he saw these wonderful buildings being built, being designed by leading architects, and he also picked up a copy of a very influential book called The Beauties of Modern Architecture by a New York architect named Menard Lefevre. So he added that to his sizable collection of pattern books, which he already had with him. Of course, pattern books in the 19th century were books that explained all about various architectural styles and histories, and even how to design staircases and how to bill people for work you're doing and all sorts of things. So he added this Menard Lefevre book, which you may be wondering why in the world am I mentioning this strange named man right now? You'll see in a moment. But one more thing about this photograph. It puzzled us for a long time as to why this building doesn't, the Spangler's Corner, the big two-story brick building that everyone believed was built in 1848, why it doesn't show up in this photograph. This must be... The photographs flipped. No, that's not right. We came up with all sorts of excuses. The easiest excuse is that Spangler's Corner that we know today wasn't built till 1866. So, in fact, this is a Civil War era photograph of the State Capitol building with the one story Spangler's Corner building on the corner, not the two story that's there today. And again, there is our building. Beautiful Greek Revival. Again, I mentioned already that originally these openings were flat-topped, which is much more typical of Greek Revival architecture. The Greeks, we feel, knew about the arts, they knew about everything, but they just didn't use it in their architecture so much. If you think about Greek temples, a lot of flat-topped openings. Arches are more typical of Roman architecture with the Colosseum and aqueducts, but the Greeks didn't really use the arch, per se. So most Greek Revival architecture doesn't have arched openings. And this, of course, is the back of the building, which, um, of course, this is the front, and that's the back, which faces the interstate. I just think it's very interesting. In the 19th century, it was fairly typical, and I guess to some degree it still is, the back of house, where well, you don't see it, you didn't spend a great lot of money on it. And to our knowledge, this wall on the back was never, ever stuccoed, and the first floor was never clad in stone as the front and the ends were originally clad in stone, which the original stone was quarried near Raymond, um, the stone got a reputation for being very bad and not holding up very well, which is why a lot of this stonework had to be redone. But apparently, the stone, while it wasn't great, uh, to make things worse, the state was given the worst stone out of the quarry, while the people running the quarry made money on tombstones and cistern covers. So, again, things haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, and poor Mr. Nichols, when he got here to Jackson to try and build this very impressive building, and again, he was the second person hired for the job, the first architect, um, it was beyond him. He was fired. He went away. Mr. Nichols had to come and clear off the site, start over again, take down the bad brickwork and the poor bricks and dump them in a hole, which when uh, the restoration was begun after Katrina, interestingly enough, there was a hole found with a lot of old brick in it. So that was true. So he had to start over again. He advertised for workers in New Orleans and Cincinnati and all over the place trying to get people here. It was just difficult to find good quality workmen to here to do the work, to get good brick, to get good stone, and he back and forth and labored and finally was able to get the building complete. But the back, like I said, was never ever stuccoed, all original brick, bare brick, facing towards what in the day, back in the 1830s and 40s, was a swamp that no one built back there. We didn't think we could control nature to the point that it was okay to build in a flood plain back then. Uh, of course, now, ironically, this is the most visible elevation of the building, because you see that from Interstate 55, which would have been a totally foreign concept to Mr. Nichols or anyone else in the 1830s. But, uh, of course, to keep the building as it was when designed by Mr. Nichols, or at least built under his supervision, stucco was never put back there. But it's interesting. This is the 1827-29 um, Alabama Capitol in Tuscaloosa. This is the way our old Capitol looked at about 1969. Now, you'll notice it looks quite a bit different than it does today. We moved a little bit away from Mr. Nichols' original design. In the 1959 to 1961 first restoration of the building, when it was converted from an office building into a state history museum, the decision was made 
towards the end of the restoration to remove all of the stucco, even though we know it had been there. And there was even a record that a man named Caleb Parker was paid in 1840 to stucco the building. It was determined that it was more appropriate to remove it. There was a belief held that it was originally not stuccoed, which isn't true. Um, and then you see in the tympanum here, the square part of the portico, this little round window, which was not a part of Mr. Nichols' original design. A Greek Revival, pure Greek Revival buildings don't, don't have those little round sort of Roman bullseye windows. It would have been a simple, flat, unadorned tympanum. And of course, in Greek temples, they would have been filled with sculpture, but in Greek Revival architecture, they didn't do that. But it's interesting to note that these changes, including the arcading from 1870 across the front portico there, then the removal of the stucco really makes Mr. Nichols' building look like the 10-year-old Dur state capital in Alabama, which was, I think, probably subconsciously done maybe because something in historic preservation we fight with a lot, uh, people always want to early up their buildings and make them look older than maybe they really are. And there was a big popular... Um, attraction, I guess is the best way to say it, for exposed brick or old brick or reused brick in the 1960s and 70s. And all that together gave the building an appearance that Mr. Nichols would have not been very happy with, <laughs> to say the least. So fortunately, we were able, the Department of Archives and History was able, after Katrina, to return the stucco and to, more about the little hole in the window in a minute, and here's the process that was gone through to try and match the stucco to the stone as close as possible. You can see how many test panels were done. And to this day, obviously, when it rains, you can still tell the stone gets wet differently than the stucco. But when it dries, it's a good match. And again, the rear elevation was never stuccoed. Um, no indication that Mr. Nichols ever intended for it to be, but it wasn't. And again, the front facing down Capitol Street towards the city, and the northern and southern ends were really all anybody saw, so they didn't spend the money. And back a little more about this uh, window. You see, this is how it looks today, restored to the way it looked in the 19th century when it was the state capitol. There was no window or not even a clock, even though it is believed that a hole, the hole was cut here at some point, and this is a very early uh, photograph of the building, late 19th century, that shows something there and even in 1861, a uh, New York uh, Times correspondent, I think it was here to cover the secession convention, and talked about the rusty face of an old clock. But that and a state record from the late 1840s indicating that the city of Jackson wished to give the state a clock are the only two references to there ever being a clock in the building. Uh, in the course of all the restoration and looking for records and artifacts, no clock was ever located. My theory is this, um, the, the state got very excited about the possibility of the city giving them a clock and jumped ahead of the gun, if you will, and got ready for it, and the clock didn't make it. <laughs> so they had to patch the hole. That's my opinion. But as the restoration after Katrina was uh, gearing up, the plan was to put that round window there. That round window dated from 1916, when the building was converted after a long period of disuse into state offices. The architect for the conversion into state offices was Theodore Link, the architect for the new state capitol building. And obviously finding this evidence here, he decided he would put a little bullseye window in there, and he did. But in the course of the restoration, to make the building resemble as much as possible its 19th century appearance when it served as the state capitol building, the determination was made to make a simple tympanum as you see today. So that's where that came from. So Mr. Nichols did not do this. <laughs> Views of the uh, house chamber on the interior, which we know originally had a similar configuration to this, the, the original um, house chamber in the Alabama Capitol in Tuscaloosa. Um, obviously, you can see it's a much bigger room. The state capitol was considerable, our state capitol, the one in Jackson, was considerably wider and deeper than the one in Alabama. But in the 1870s, uh, late 60s and 70s, as more counties were created during Reconstruction, more seats were needed in the House chamber. So it was remodeled, the columns removed, and a narrower gallery added across the side and around the back. So it took that appearance in 1870. And this is the Senate, as it looked about the time the building had been left in 1903 for the new capitol. 
Uh, it looks bad. Well, unfortunately, it was bad. Uh, Mr. Nichols was a very talented designer. He had a beautiful ideas, great concepts. They were beautiful buildings, but his roofs leaked, which, you know, isn't that uncommon with great architects. They don't often understand sometimes the mechanics of how a building should operate. And to furthermore plague Mr. Nichols, um, the, as Eudora Welty says, the slow-moving earthquake of Yazoo Clay caused problems with the poor building to pull and push and back and forth. And in fact, even by 1860, when the building was barely 20 years old, it needed a lot of work. Well, the state was preoccupied for about five years until 1865 before they could get back to that. And finally, by 1870, they were able to pull the building back together, fix the front portico, which had suffered a lot from the poor quality of the stone, enlarge the house chamber and things like that, and add additional gas lighting. But, whoops, ooh, hello. Sorry, hang on a minute. The, um, the building, like I said, was abandoned essentially in 1903 when the legislature moved to the new capital, and that's a whole other issue, a whole other story. The building sat largely empty. Uh, it was used for the state fairgrounds as a judge a pavilion for exhibits and various things connected with the state fairgrounds, of course, is just down the hill. But in 1909, yes, 1909, a hurricane hit the building and ripped the roof off. And it sat exposed to the elements for almost, well, till 1916. So a lot of the damage was due to that, obviously. So we are very fortunate that sentiment got in the way and the building was determined important enough to be saved, even if there are years of back and forth and who knows what was going to happen, people pushing for its demolition and all sorts of things, we were able to save the building. The center rotunda is largely original to the 1840s. The rest is not, but it's reconstruction and reassembled. Uh, when it was converted into offices, we lost the original House and Senate chamber, but they were recreated in 5961 and then further refined after the Katrina restoration, or part of the Katrina restoration. So fortunately, we have this building. But again, remember that Mr. Nichols' first state capital in North Carolina burned in the 1830s. His second one burned in the 1920s. We're very fortunate that ours is here. And again, I think as an architectural historian, it's his best of the three because it shows his sophistication, his incorporating everything he learned from the beginning in Bath all the way to that wonderful sort of epiphany he had in New Orleans and learned about new architectural modes of Greek revival and brought all that to Jackson. Little bitty out in the middle of nowhere, where nobody wanted to be at the time, Jackson. So we get a grand building designed by a man who had designed three state capitals at the time, probably the only person in the country at that point who could claim such a thing, and we still have it to this day. And I thought it would be very interesting to see in succession the original uh, North Carolina remodeling, well, I shouldn't say original, his first building, the remodeling of the North Carolina capital, and how similar the Alabama capital in Tuscaloosa is, and then how, as it was designed by Mr. Nichols, it's related, but much larger and grander and much more cohesive of a design in the Greek Revival style. And just in case anybody wonders, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1969. It was made a National Historic Landmark in 1990, which is the highest designation given by the federal government on historic places. It was made, a, oh my goodness, sorry y'all. It was made a Mississippi landmark in 1996, and it was documented by the Historic American Building Survey in 1936 and again in 1972. So it's a well-documented historic building. Now on to the governor's mansion, which I think is what led Chris to ask me to do this because of the program that was supposed to be today about the governor's mansion, so we'll talk about it. Um, designed again by William Nichols, the governor's mansion was completed essentially in 1842. Governor and Mrs. Tillman Tucker moved in. They were the first to occupy it. And I love this. The second oldest governor's house in the country still used for its original purpose, which is true. Virginia's is older than ours, 1842, than Illinois' 1855, and Texas' 1857 or something. So it is interesting that we do happen to have the second oldest and still being occupied by the governor, again, after a difficult history that mirrors the history of the old capital. The building was substantially enlarged in 1908 and again in 1971, both after the building was condemned and plans were made to demolish it, or at least anticipated that it would be demolished in both cases, but thankfully we were able to save the building. 
It's interesting too, um, Mr. Nichols, in addition to remodeling the state house in Raleigh, did remodel and do a little work on their governor's mansion in Raleigh, which unfortunately isn't there. It was torn down in 1885, but he was involved with that even there. This is one of the earliest colorized views of the governor's mansion that I've been able to find. This color postcard postdates 1883 because of the spire of the Methodist church that was built in that year. And other than that, I'm not exactly sure when, but I know it was before 1908 because you can see the original red brick as it was originally seen. And then the pilasters uh, in this uh, stucco color around the building, uh, given the impression of a row of columns, but in this case pilasters, which are square sections of columns, and the original semicircular portico with the Corinthian column capitals and all the wonderful uh, details that are still there to this day. And just to kind of let you know that it's a little different um, than it was originally, this was pretty much Mr. Nichols' original design. This shows the original family cottage in the back. And these floor plans date from a letter during Reconstruction when Ms. Ames was a the wife of the governor had moved in and she was writing letters and sketched the floor plan of the house as it was at the time. And as an architectural historian, I like floor plans. It's, they're very fun. So you can see this is the land itself, the block on which the mansion sits that would be facing towards Capitol Street here. This shows a piazza around the little cottage, as you can see it there. And then the cookhouse and the garden and the storehouses all to the side over there. The basement had a kitchen, as well as coal rooms, wood rooms, and other storage facilities. And the back stair at the time went up into the first floor with the dining room. That's been removed. And then the front hall, octagonal front hall, as it has always been, is largely original. We know due to some work that was done there recently that there's a lot more original 1840s fabric in the governor's mansion than you might believe, despite some of the best efforts of some people in the past to not have that be the case. But still, it's, a lot of it's still there. You'll notice that the staircase in this photograph continues on the wall up as the staircase that's there today does and then the drawing room on the side there, and the blue room and the dining room on the other side. And then a similar uh, view of the mansion without the trees in the way showing the little um, family quarters. And that's basically how it was until 1908. Um, in 1842, Jackson was small, a small little town, even by Mississippi standards. There were the towns of Natchez and Columbus, even Aberdeen were larger than Jackson in the 1840s. But by 1908, Jackson was moving on up there and had become a considerably larger town than it had been. Still wasn't quite the largest in the state yet. That still belonged to Meridian. But it was much bigger than it used to be. And the area around the mansion had changed and was now commercial buildings and churches and was much less residential in scale than it might have been originally and certainly more built up. The house itself, which often plagues public buildings, was neglected. Um, and things had been allowed to fall apart. And so there was a big push to tear it down in 1908, clear the lot, sell it for a commercial building, uh, and then just build a new house for the governor, I guess in Bellhaven or someplace. But fortunately, public sentiment wouldn't let that happen. And uh, the use of, or misuse of history in this case, uh, the cry went out, shall we demolish what Sherman would not burn? Which is a whole big story that isn't worth getting into, but it worked, we saved the house. And in so doing, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. So doing the backward, uh, the cottage on the back was removed and replaced with a two-store wing, which you'll see later. So that's how it happened to get, survive the first time. Now this is uh, an illustration from Stuart and Rivette's Antiquities of Athens that shows the Karagic Monument of Lysicrates, and then as it is in a contemporary photograph. And the reason I include that was this semicircular portico is quite well, obviously inspired by this, from Mr. Nichols was inspired by this when he designed the portico of the governor's mansion in 1840. And most often we think about Greek revival buildings having the temple front like we see at the old capitol, but this is an example of actually a monument to a choir master and a singer that was erected a long time ago <laughs> in ancient Greece being the inspiration for the front of our governor's mansion. And it's an unusual use of that uh, device. 
I heard some time ago, which certainly isn't true, but it's an interesting story, that the reason that the governor's mansion has a semicircular portico facing on the Capitol Street as it does in relationship to the old Capitol was similar to the U.S. Capitol and the mall and the White House, which is just a coincidence. There's really no reason that it would be that way. But still, you may hear that. In fact, Mr. Nichols was just inspired to borrow an ancient Greek monument and take that as inspiration for the portico of the house. So in case those of you that are wondering, that's where that came from. And I may, you may recall, when I started this about three years ago, we mentioned the architect Menard Lefevre. You remember Mr. Lefevre? Well, he was a very prominent New York architect. He designed many significant buildings. But most importantly to us, uh, and, and indeed I think to the architectural history of the entire country, he produced a pattern book called The Beauties of Modern Architecture, the first publication in 1835, about the time Mr. Nichols was in New Orleans and apparently acquired a copy of this book. So he brought again to Jackson, little Jackson in the middle of nowhere where no one supposedly wished to be, he bought not only the influence of the greatest and latest architecture from New Orleans, but the details from a New York architect. And a lot of the architectural details that Mr. Lefevre designed and published in this book show up in Jackson about a decade before they show up in Natchez, which of course was much larger and much wealthier. So I think that's pretty interesting. And this is one of the pattern book pages show mantelpieces. And this one should look very familiar to you because Mr. Nichols particularly liked that one because he used it several times. And here's an original surviving mantelpiece in the governor's mansion taken almost line for line from the Menard Lefevre pattern book. Now those mantelpieces, there are two of them that survived their original. They made their way over the course of events to the second floor as the first floor was remodeled and updated over the late 19th and into the 20th century. And then in 1908, when it was remodeled for the first time, they made their way, one of them, to the new wing in the back, I guess, at some point. And then um, we'll see later on in the 1970s restoration, which was the second time we almost lost it, the last of the historic mantles that had anything to do with the house on the first floor were removed completely and replaced with black marble ones, which we'll see in a moment. But it is pretty remarkable to have that. And again, considering what I had heard when I first started working in historic preservation, that nothing was left of the original, there's a lot still there that Mr. Nichols saw. Another example, these wonderful door cases from Mr. Menard Lefevre. Of course, these photographs from the 1930s Historic American Building Survey, the first time the mansion was documented. And then we see this is the, the double parlor on the left as you go in the front door. They're the rose parlors, I think they're called now. Shows the original surround here, which is this area right here. We don't have the um, ionic columns and antis there that we don't have those, but we have everything else pretty much there and looking from the front rose parlor into the back rose parlor. Some of this is 1842, some of it is 1908, some of it is 1970-whatever, but it's all a part of the history of the mansion. And then here we see on the right-hand side, which is now I think the blue parlor looking into the dining room and the similar view today, um, so work that had to be undertaken recently involved the removal of all of the furnishings, which all date from the 1970s by and large, at least on the first floor. What furnishings were there in 1842, which were few, and that were gathered by the state and added to before the war, all disappeared during the course of the war, and apparently we don't know if they were stolen, burned, destroyed, or if they ended up in somebody's house someplace, but they're not there. The furnishings that you see in the mansion today all date from the second restoration, which I guess is more accurately a restoration than the first remodeling in 1908, that occurred in the 1970s when professionals were hired to undertake the restoration of the house, one of the first times such a thing happened in this country. And instead of getting furnishings or things that are, might actually have been in the house, they looked for very high-style furnishings from the period that the house stylistically dated to. So it's much more finely furnished than it would have been in the 19th century. But it's a beautiful place. Again, we see the mantelpiece, I think, for the third time. These are the original balcony doors that are, I believe, original to 1842, that they've survived all this time is remarkable. It's on the second floor, looking out into the original Corinthian columns, capitals, and everything on the front portico there. 
This is the 1908 wing on the back. You remember the earlier postcard that showed the little cottage, which was re really just four rooms, uh, and obviously the needs of the family and all had grown considerably, and in 1908, they tore down the cottage, built this two-story brick addition of yellow brick, and then covered the original 19th century brickwork with a thin yellow pressed brick to make it all tie in. So the governor's mansion from 1908 to about 1940 was yellow. Interesting. It was painted white in 1940 and it has remained since then. This was the staircase installed in 1908, not the one we're used to seeing which swirls up to the left-hand wall, which we know in the letters from the Mrs. Ames in the 1860s, it shows it basically going up that way. Um, we also know that in the floor there are scars of where the newel landed and the staircase began. All of this trim was added in 1908 when these walls were opened up. So a little bit was changed to the first floor of the house, but still again, we have a lot of the original house there. So you won't see this when you go to the governor's mansion today, so this may look foreign to you, but it was there from 1908 to 1971. And there is the reconstructed staircase in the approximate location of the Nichols Stair. Uh, but these columns, this column screen date from original 1842 for the most part. And these niches are a original and some replacement material, but they were there originally, the niches there in the entrance hall. And this little interesting niche was added in the 1970s. Originally, there was a large window on the landing that looked out over the roof of the little cottage, but when that came down in 1908, obviously you have a building right there, so they did something different with the staircase there, and then in the 1970s they replaced that effect with this little niche. So that's not original. And the famous black marble mantelpieces, which came from one or two houses in upstate New York, which were part of the refurbishment and redecorating of the house in the 1970s. Again, the idea being to furnish it with uh, elements, furniture of the period of the design of the house, which means that the furniture is actually a little bit earlier than the house and it's designed considerably finer than anything that would have been there in the 1840s, but certainly stylistically in scale fits very nicely with the house and certainly we have a history of almost 50 years of that being the way, so it's now part of the history of the house. But those four black marble mantles were never there in the 19th century. And the Governor's Mansion, listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1969, one of the earliest uh, listings on the National Register, along with the Old Capitol. On March uh, 1976, it was made a contributing element in the Smith Park National Register Historic District, so it's been listed twice on the National Register. A National Historic Landmark on 24th of April 1975. Mississippi Landmark, May of 1986. And then it was documented three separate times by the Historic American Building Survey, 1936, 72, and 75. And I know I've mentioned this a couple of times. I don't know if any of you know what the Historic American Building Survey is. But briefly, it was a program begun in the 1930s in the Depression by the Roosevelt administration as a way to essentially put out-of-work architects to work documenting historic buildings around the country with the ultimate goal of there being an architectural history for each state. That didn't happen. But we do have lots of wonderful drawings and photographs of buildings that in many cases, unfortunately, are gone. Now, another building Mr. Nichols did in Jackson, and uh, won't, won't see a whole lot about this, but is the Mississippi State Penitentiary, which was built in the Gothic Revival style where the new capital is. I love saying that. But that's where the original penitentiary was. And in a Gothic Revival style, not the Greek Revival, not a classical Revival style, but a Gothic Revival. The other penitentiary, you know, he did. He did in Louisiana. And it was a very simple, almost devoid of any style building. But in this case, he chose the Gothic Revival. And this photograph is from the later 19th century. The building was heavily damaged during the Civil War, but it was rebuilt, we believe, largely along the original uh, design of Mr. Nichols. And this is a view inside the yard showing some of the buildings there. And this, of course, again, is our penitentiary, but this is the Eastern State Penitentiary in Pittsburgh, built in 1824, 20 years or so before our penitentiary. Why is that in here? Well, in the 19th century, very often architects would choose the style of a building based on what its use was to be. 
And the way inmates were housed, uh, it was shifting from prisons to penitentiaries, which are slightly different in what they do, and the way the prisons were designed were, was changing at that point, like so many things in the 19th century. But the Gothic, which makes you think of the Bastille or the Tower of London or a castle, a fortified place, it had that visual imagery. It's a place you don't want to be kept against your will, obviously. So Mr. Nichols chose that, and this was designed by a, uh, another English immigrant architect, um, and he obviously was aware of it, and designed our penitentiary in the style, which was torn down largely by 1900 when Parchman opened up in the Delta, and then the state had a big piece of property in the middle of town that was where they decided to build the current state capital. And the University of Mississippi, which I didn't attend here, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, the Lyceum, the original main administration building designed by Mr. Nichols. We already mentioned his work at the University of North Carolina. And then when he was in Alabama, he designed the original campus for the University of Alabama there in Tuscaloosa, which uh, was a different plan altogether. The original building at the University of Alabama was sat in the middle of a quadrangle with buildings surrounding it, inspired supposedly by the University of Virginia. All of that was burned to the ground towards the end of the Civil War, so all of that is gone, except for some archaeological remnants. Ours, however, survives. Mr. Nichols came back uh, as state architect in the late 1840s to design the Lyceum and associated buildings, as well as the plan for the original campus. Now, the wings here on either side were added in the early 20th century by Theodore Link, the architect of the new capital. Those two men had a very interesting sort of parallel experience, and that would be a very interesting program someday to discuss as well. You can see these early black and white photographs very early on, but by 1860, the building was extended by three bays in the rear, and you can see here on the back as well. But originally, it was a very pure temple front building that faced onto a, well, I'll show you, an octagonal space right here with the other original buildings and the size of the octagon, and the eighth side of the octagon open to the road to Oxford. So this was the original plan of the University of Virginia. Uh, no, it was not, of the University of Mississippi, beg your pardon. As opposed to what was done in Alabama with the building in the middle, and the, the main building in the middle, and the building surrounding it. In this case, it's an open octagon with a view back down the road to Oxford, reflecting and respecting the topography of Oxford much more so than another design might have done. So. That was Mr. Nichols' last great hurrah for the state of Mississippi. Uh, he did come back uh, slightly before this and build the new fence around the old capital, which we recreated, I say we, the Archi Department of Archives and History, recreated after Katrina. And uh, he did the Lyceum and a few other things, but before too long, he was in Lexington working on a male and female academy, a school there, which he did many schools in his career. Probably the courthouse that isn't mentioned in the book because we couldn't find any clear evidence that he in fact did it, but apparently since that time, as always happens, someone found a newspaper reference from the day that he did. But anyway, he was working in Lexington, passed away, and was buried in the Odd Phillips Cemetery in 1853. So he finished his career in Mississippi and left us with some wonderful buildings and really had an influence on what state capitals really, in many people's minds, should be and ought to be and really kind of set the pattern for that or help set the pattern. So that is the program on Mr. Nichols. I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can. Do you happen to know how much he was paid <laughs> for his work on the old capitol in the governor's mansion? And also, did he have an office provided for his work as an architect? And where um, was it? He was paid, and I don't know the exact amount, but it was a pretty good salary for the day, as I understand. He just, I don't know about where his office is located. I really don't. Um, he was here and worked here in Jackson and owned property in Jackson, uh, still owned property even after he'd moved up to Oxford to supervise up there, but I really don't know any more than that. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, 
My understanding is that um, slave owners, this is the time of course during slavery, so slave owners would hire their slaves to assist in the building of state capitals and state buildings and federal buildings because they had some of the skills that were required, carpentry and bricklayers and plumbers and those kind of people were slaves as well. And so slave owners would use, would um, hire some of their skilled workers to engage in building these um, federal buildings and state buildings and so on. I'm wondering if I am Mr. Nichols, and, and of course a good example of that is um, the White House itself, where slaves were used considerably to assist in building of um, the White House. And like I said, slaves were used a lot, were used a lot to build other state houses and federal buildings. I'm wondering if Mr. Nichols actually used any slave or hired any slave labor to assist in his building product programs. Um, there was a variety of labor used. Some slave labor was used. Uh, there were uh, professional white laborers that were hired as well. It was a variety, whoever he could get. Uh, certainly, there's a different skill set needed to clear the site and lay the bricks and do all that. And then there is a different skill set for the people that did the fine finish carpentry work and such. The old capital was built itself over the greater part of a decade. And uh, you had the penitentiary and the governor's mansion going on shortly after that. So it, is, uh, it was a variety of work being done by a variety of people. And there is a small um, part of the preservation exhibit in the old capital that does specifically relate to some of those uh, enslaved individuals that worked over there, some records that were found, uh, in addition to the fact that Mr. Charles Manship, who owned the Manship House, did some decorative painting and graining. So there was a, a lot of different people involved with the construction of the buildings. Uh, on the university campus in Oxford, uh, in addition to the Lyceum, it's my understanding there were two or three dormitories built and the chapel. The chapel still is standing. Yes. Anything else besides the Lyceum and the chapel? Not from Mr. Nichols' period. The observatory was built in the late 1850s, but Mr. Nichols had passed away at that point, um, and there was a different designer for that. But of his work at the uh, campus, the Lyceum and the original configuration of that center part of the campus and the chapel were his work. Hi. Thank you, Todd. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Could you talk a little bit about how these buildings, the Capitol and the Governor's Mansion, were lighted and yeah. how that changed over the years? And then I have a second question. That 1869 photograph taken mm -hmm. from the Capitol, yes. uh, the old Capitol mm -hmm. down Capitol Street, the penitentiary doesn't seem to show those turrets. So, when were they added? Yeah, good question. Um, originally, the building would have been lit with oil lamps. Uh, all those buildings would have been oil lamps, probably originally uh, whale oil, later candles maybe, some as well. Candles were expensive. By the late 1850s, Jackson had a gas works, which I believe was located behind where the city hall is. And some rudimentary gas work was installed, gas lighting was installed in the old Capitol and the governor's mansion. In fact, some of the plaster work was remodeled and updated in the governor's mansion as part of the installation of gas fixtures right before uh, right, late 1850s. Um, yes, the 1869 panorama does show the penitentiary from a distance, shows some of what was going on there. Um, the penitentiary was pretty heavily damaged, like I said, during the war because it was used for military purposes. And so it was rebuilt and expanded and elaborated. In fact, there was a tower in the photograph that I showed that very clearly is an 1870s or 80s alteration. But the general concept, the overall concept of the design, uh, Gothic, we believe, was Mr. Nichols. But it just got, like with so many things, expanded and enlarged and reworked over time. <laughs> 
I'm curious to know how he came to be buried in Lexington, <laughs> given that he was a significant architect in the capital city. And did he have a family? Yes, he did have a family. He had at least, he was married at least twice. Uh, first wife passed away, he was married a second time. They had some property here in the Jackson area. In fact, after he passed away, there was a newspaper um, notice for his estate being settled. He was in Lexington supervising the construction of the school building and died and was buried there. <laughs> he, Mr. Nichols is a kind of a hard character to follow and understand. He, like I said, he overran budgets a lot, and I think not just on public buildings, and I think he had a tendency to be involved with some scandals and things, and he managed to move around a bit, so I don't really know exactly. He, he, yes, that's entirely possible, and that was the very end of, obviously, the very end of his career, um, and truthfully, by the early 1850s, he was 80, and uh, almost 80, and um, 73, I guess, sorry, I'm jumping up a little bit, but he was um, becoming an out-of-fashion architect, too. The Greek Revival was beginning to, at least that style, beginning to wane. He was old news, so, you know, kind of... And it was, there was very little in the way of an obituary around in the, in the papers that we could find um, when he died. It was just kind of like he was almost forgotten that early, it feels. It's kind of sad. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. For your presentation. The, you. the buildings are beautiful. The architecture is beautiful architecture. As in New Orleans, they have this, the name of the road, but all of these mansions are along mm -hmm. the, the, the street. Behind all of the mansions are the, were the slaves, slave quarters in order to keep the structures maintained. Is this capital built in the middle of nowhere at the time, or was it built near an African-American or the slave community at the time? Well, that's a question that I'm not all that able to answer. I can tell you that Jackson was fairly new. It had really only been settled beginning in the 18, very early 1820s. Uh, people had moved here, but by and large, very few. There were certainly farms and plantations out, and there were other cities and, well, that's maybe too much of a statement, towns in the county, like Clinton and other places that were more substantial where people lived. A lot of people were here just when the legislature was in session because they pretty much had to be. So I think as early as the, the this city was 20 years old, about the time the Capitol building was finished. So it wasn't a very old town, so things were still kind of, I guess, in a state of flux, being developed and being pulled together. So I don't know that there was any really established community of any sort here prior to the state building what they built here. That's good, right? Can you address the fencing around the governor's mansion and when it was <laughs> extended and the wall built in the back? And why? Yes. All right. That's a very good question. The oldest image I know about the fencing and the lady that was involved with the governor's mansion for a long time has left. I kept checking her to see. But the wrought iron fence that shows, I'm sorry, not wrought, cast iron fence that shows up around the governor's mansion in that colorized postcard is an 1870s or 80s fence. I don't know that I have ever seen a clear image of an earlier fence around the property. I suspect, given what I know about city planning, such as it is, that there was a fence, because back in the 19th century, fences were to keep livestock out of your yard, not to fence things in, because livestock pretty much ran free when they were converting Smith Park from an open wild field into a into a park. They actually talked about fencing it off to keep the animals out. So I'm sure there was some sort of fence there prior to that 1870s cast iron fence, not wrought, which, since I brought it up, the fence at the old capital is actually wrought iron, which as the original one was, which means it was wrought by hand, not cast in a mold, which is the fence that shows up in that postcard of the governor's mansion. 
That fence, I believe, was removed or at least was gone by 1908 and the lot pretty much open at that point. Then for obvious security reasons and such, in the 1970s, they added the fence that's there now around the entire block. I think more for security and other purposes than anything else. I think it was just to keep the governor, this, it, rather than having a fence to keep the animals out, they were keeping the governor safe inside. That's the only reason I know that they would have done it that way. And I think that's referenced because also in 1971 and on, when they built the new wing on the back, uh, it was much bigger, much larger, and the way the house was, even, was used had changed a lot from 1908 even. So the governor had an office there a more formal office there after 71. He did, I think, have some kind of office prior to, but still kind of changed, I think, the way it was used. And again, having a residence in the middle of a busy downtown area it was determined to be good to provide some sort of fencing. Due to the late substitution of the program <laughs> and uh, the holiday, we were not able to get more copies of this book into the store. Marshall Bennett slipped over there in front of the rest of you and bought the one copy that we had on hand. We'll have some more coming, and you can pick those up later, and I'm sure Todd will be happy to sign them, come back uh, maybe even tomorrow evening for the open house, and we'll have them. We do have four copies of his Jackson's North State Street book for sale here. Uh, I think the special price today is $20, but that is cash or check. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope that we see you back here next Wednesday for our final program with Rick Cleveland, the SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey and others. But uh, for now, help me thank Todd Sanders for this program today.